pleasure to have you here today. And it's my honor to extend greetings on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the Howard University School of Education. We are really honored to partner with Teaching for Change as well as the Zen Education Project to offer this teaching on reconstruction. I'd like to really take this time to thank the organizers of this teaching. This is something that's happening, that happening nationally so that we can be more informed. I know that the organizers have spent hours on the phone, literally hours on the phone to bring together a great program for you all. Um, so for it to, if you all can help me to recognize the organizers of the program by giving them a round of applause. So I know we have a variety of people here. How many of you are currently teachers? Okay, wow, wonderful, great to see. And how many of you are currently pre-service educators? Great, oh, great, great. <laughs> that really means a lot to us uh, when we started having conversations about what this program would look like. I really insisted that our pre-service educators were invited and welcome to come because within a year or two, they're gonna be where you are as classroom teachers and hopefully you're helping to model what good instruction looks like for them. Um, so I want you to know that Howard University was born out of the era of Reconstruction. Marking the time of the end of the Civil War, Reconstruction meant many things to many people. There were dreams of hope, independence, and prosperity, but there were also tangible actions to defer hope, independence, and prosperity. How in this moment in history is, how this moment in history is taught can be the difference between feelings of empathy towards the road toward to advocacy. It is important to note that the founding of Howard University in 1867 also coincides with the beginning of teacher education at Howard. Its founders envisioned the institution as a resource for the training of black teachers and preachers for the purpose of educating and uplifting the nearly four million emancipated slaves. Since 1867, Howard University has long held a commitment to the study of disadvantaged, per disadvantaged persons in American society and throughout the world. The goal continues to be the elimination of inequities related to race, color, social, economic, and political circumstances. At the School of Education, we have a paramount interest in meeting the needs of urban school communities. We do so by utilizing an anti-deficit approach in the pursuit of teaching, research, and service. Teachings have been known to bring the larger community together, as you can see, to inform about social or political issues. They are free and they are open to the public. It is meant to be a practical, participatory, and action-oriented. Therefore, it is quite fitting that this teaching is being held at the Howard University School of Education. Today, we will provide you with the tools to educate, to empower, and push past and through the disparaging discourse that seemed to attempt to cloud our vision and redirect our efforts. I recently read that there are over 1,500 symbols of the Confederacy on display in public spaces. Notably, the majority of Confederate statues were built following the Reconstruction period between the, the times of 1885 and 1930. This is a time when black agency was more persistent urbanization was happening and immigration started to show. And this was threatening Southern white hegemony. Recognizing that as our president, president of our university that is, recognizing <laughs> what he often says, <laughs> that the time is always now, <laughs> we are committed to making an impact. We look forward to this continued dialogue with our featured and distinguished scholars today we take our responsibility for your preparation serious. Let's not only continue to make history, let's also make sure that we are making a difference. Um, so this event, in addition uh, to the amazing support from the Howard School of Education, um, is co-sponsored by the Zen Education Project. Um, if you haven't checked out the Zen Ed Project website, please do. It's an amazing resource for um, teaching people's history. Um, as well as the D.C. Area Educators for Social Justice. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with the D.C. Area Educators for Social Justice, talk to Faye Cologne over there. Um, 
So uh, I know, uh, Donna, we, are, we already gave us a sense that there's a lot of teachers in the room. How, how many teachers from, I'm interested, uh, elementary school? How many elementary school teachers do we have? Ooh, awesome. How many pre, any pre-K? Okay, awesome. Uh, how about um, middle school, high school? Awesome, awesome. How about higher ed? How many higher ed teachers? Awesome, awesome, okay. Um, this is really excited. Um, so how many, how many people are from DC? Some v Virginia? Maryland? Anywhere else? Shout out, shout out. Georgia, Atlanta? New York, yeah, all right. All right, <laughs> all, right all right, we got a lot of places. Um, and then, uh, so we've got people from a lot of different places, a lot of different backgrounds. What, how many people, and I'm talking more than just like a, a paragraph in your textbook here, how many people learned about um, reconstruction when you were in elementary, middle, high school? How many people had a unit on reconstruction? Raise them high, I wanna, I wanna see how many. Okay, so what, like maybe 20% in the room? Okay, all right, is that, is that a good estimate? Okay. <laughs> um, so we wanna make sure that you know, our students learn more than, than we did, for sure. Um, and, that's, and that's part of uh, why we're here today. Um, so this, this teaching is part of um, a campaign that's, uh, that the Zen Education Project started a, a, a year or two ago um, called the Teach Reconstruction Campaign. Um, and one of the things that we noticed uh, when we were going through the kind of most of the corporate textbooks that are out there um, is that although, you know, they no longer kind of parrot the racist Dunning School interpretation of Reconstruction, they still have a, a narrative that mostly focuses on white people and focuses on people at, at mostly at the top of society. Um, Reconstruction is talked about as this period where there's, you know, these intense debates between the president and the radical Republicans in Congress, and then there's this big backlash, right, white supremacist backlash. Um, and we, it, felt like that was really not uh, enough of the story um, to tell. And we wanted to help teachers tell a different story um, about Reconstruction because it was a period um, where black people fought and organized to define the meaning of freedom, um, a period where there was real black political power in the South, um, a period where despite all sorts of you know, racist violence, black lives, black actions, black ideas mattered and, and really determined the course of the nation for a short, short time. Um, and so we wanted to provide teachers with more um, resources to elevate this hidden history um, of Reconstruction. So just to, to briefly go, go over what we've, got at, what we've been doing, um, we've got, uh, a bunch of new reviews on our website of books um, and resources for teachers um, from pre-K to, to high school, although not a ton out there. Uh, as you can imagine, the lower the grade, the grade you get, but there are a few for elementary and, um, and middle school that we've reviewed. Um, and then we're also um, putting out lessons. So um, the, the very first lesson we put out, um, Reconstructing uh, the South, is a role play it's, um, that I'm gonna do in one of the um, workshops afterwards. Um, we've also got a brand new lesson that uh, a num number of my colleagues um, are gonna do in a workshop afterwards and we've been developing several others to try and elevate um, this hidden history of reconstruction. Um, and another thing that we just launched uh, within the last two weeks um, is this student project. Um, as Dawn was saying, that, that just appalling, not just how many Confederate monuments there are, but how few Reconstruction monuments there are. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do um, was encourage students and teachers to kind of take on this project of delving into their uh, local Reconstruction history and identifying sites that should be memorialized, sites that, that tell a different story of Reconstruction. So people should definitely check out um, this new page on our website. Um, it has instructions for teachers who are interested in launching into this project uh, with their students.
First, we're going to have Turkaya Lowe, who is the chief historian at the National Park Service. Um, and if you haven't taken a look at the National Park Service's theme study on reconstruction, I cannot recommend it enough. It's like it's it's like a people's history of reconstruction is how I would explain it. It's a really amazing theme study. Um, Paul Gardulo, um, who's the museum curator and director of the Center uh, for the Study of Global Slavery at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and then uh, Greg Carr, associate professor of Afri Africana Studies and chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies here at Howard. Um, and I, I don't know if he remembers, but last time I saw uh, Dr. Carr was, uh, I was taking a group of my students from uh, New York City uh, to protest uh, the, president, the current president's inauguration. Uh, and we stopped by Dr. Carr's class the, the day before, and it was quite incredible. I'll tell you, an experience for our students. So I'm really glad to have him on the panel. Um, and then uh, last, we're going to hear from James Lowen, um, who is the author of, of a lot of books, but um, most notably, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, um, Lies Across America, What Our Historic Sites got, uh, Get Wrong. Um, and uh, Dr. Lowen is also uh, uh, re one of our Teach Reconstruction campaign advisors. Um, so, all right, with that, I'm going to hand it to Turkai. I am so happy and gratified to see all of you here tonight as we saw that 20%, 10%, I would say, um, who learned about Reconstruction Era history um, and also the relevance that it has for today. Um, I want to ensure that 100% of this generation knows the stories, um, knows the history. Um, we at the National Park Service celebrated the, or commemorated the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Um, in discussing how the National Park Service would tell that history, we committed to making sure that the Reconstruction Era history was told as well. And to bridge the gap between Reconstruction to the end of slavery, reconstruction, and the 50th anniversary of uh, the Selma to Montgomery March. Um, so we as an agency committed to ensuring that reconstruction era history um, would be documented uh, through our various programs. So I'm just gonna highlight very quickly three of our efforts. Um, the first is the designation of the Reconstruction Era National Monument in Beaufort, South Carolina, St. Helen Island, uh, South Carolina. Um, this was years in the making. Uh, we first started doing research on looking around for a national parks unit um, that told at least a piece of the story of Reconstruction Era um, because we did not have one existing in the service at that time. Uh, we had multiple parks that uh, told pieces of the story, but no um, single park whose, whose legislative purpose was the uh, reconstruction story. Um, I failed to mention we have 417 national park units, so that inclusion of the reconstruction era national monument was a, a monumental effort, um, and we are very happy that we're now uh, interpreting that story through that unit. As Adam mentioned, we also prepared the Reconstruction Era theme study. Uh, what this is, is our National Register and National Historic Landmarks Program, which is the federal program that um, that recognizes the objects, buildings, sites, historic districts, and structures which are nationally important for, um, recon for uh, our nation's history. Um, and it's through this study that we begin nominating local national sites uh, to become recognized by the federal government. We also have our National Reconstruction Era Handbook, um, which is a collection of scholarly essays that 
that talk about the major themes of Reconstruction, so African American uh, enslavement and um, emancipation, voting rights, violence, uh, the re-entrenchment of, of white home rule, um, and various topics in Reconstruction history. So I would recommend all either visiting the Reconstruction Era site, um, looking at our theme study and our handbook in order to um, get some, some general readable knowledge of the Reconstruction Era through the National Park Service. Thank you so much. But what is your emancipation? When you turned us loose, you gave us no acres. You turned us loose to the sky, to the storm, to the whirlwind, and worst of all, you turned us loose to the wrath of our infuriated masters. That's Frederick Douglass, 1876. They asked me to speak, for, speak very briefly, right? So I got to lead with Frederick Douglass. Um, <laughs> But I think what's compelling about that brief quote is this sense of the storm that he's producing, right? This sense of this moment in time where it seems like history has cracked open. I want us to think in our classes, I think, in our work, in our public institutions about what we're talking about when we're talking about reconstruction. A moment of extreme possibility, right? And extreme retrenchment. I want us to think about, and I think it's useful for us to think about reconstruction as an action verb. Reconstructing what? Certainly Frederick Douglass here gives us one vision of reconstruction, the, the palpable stormy negative side of re reconstruction. Adam hinted at the palpable potential, right, that African Americans were seizing during this moment of possibility. And I think this is where we need to engage each other and our students, right? Too often, we get trapped, we've all gotten trapped. If we know anything at all about Reconstruction, it is within this kind of, this dry political story. It is a deeply important, moving, uh, complex political story. It's a community story, though. It's a, it's a story of labor and economics. It's a story of, of um, spirituality, right? Um, but our students tend to get lost, and they don't see the forest for the trees. They get caught up in these individual debates or, or um, the facts um, when I think what we really need to be doing in our work and what, what the National Park Service is doing and what we tried to do at the Museum of African American History and Culture was to bring the drama back into the story, to make sure that we're thinking about this period as an action verb, right? to make sure that it feels relevant to our questions today, right? And I think it's beautiful that you're talking about Black Lives Matter in the context of the 1870s and the context of 2019, 2018. Um, and so very quickly, I just wanna say two ways that we try to do that in the museum that I hope are helpful to you in classroom. One is to humanize this story, um, to understand that through voices of people like Frederick Douglass, and particularly in the context of the museum, through objects as large as a home. We've collected several homes that, in my mind, bring that word, that, that, that language of reconstruction as an active verb tangibly to people, whether it's a former slave cabin that the, the formerly enslaved opened up a door in the back to recreate a sense of space, or a home uh, that people built in Poolsville, Maryland, what became Poolsville, where they added a second floor. Right? The potential and the limitations of this period of time. Uh, a guard tower on Angola Prison in Louisiana. Right? The way structures shape us. 
And even something so small as a little tin box that held uh, a man named Joseph Trammell's freedom papers. Uh, he, he retained his freedom, he earned his freedom in 1852, had to keep his, his papers that proved to the world that he was free, right? For years, he, he crafted a tin box to keep those papers solid and safe from the rain, from the elements, from the sweat of his own labor. He kept them right up until 1865 in this handmade tin box. Generations of his family kept that box and those papers with them until about five years ago, they donated them to the museum so we could share them with the world. And I think this is, this is a powerful demonstration of the ways that this history can be personalized. It's also a powerful demonstration of the ways that people who were living through this history and striving as protagonists of this history understood the preciousness of what freedom was and the fragility of what it was inside of a, a white supremacist nation and the protection and the value that they had to place upon these few tangible items. And so for me, this is a, this is a compelling way that we can get students, in fact, all of us, engaged in the history of freedom movements, understanding that this one, what we might call a period in time, has roots that reach back into slavery, has branches that reach forward into what later generations of historians call the civil rights movement, but people who lived through it, as Bernice Johnson Reagan continued to tell me around the table at, when we were building the museum, they refer to it as the freedom movement, right? So this sense of a continuation that helps draw the links between a period of enslavement, a period of reconstruction, and continual construction and reconstruction. And with that, I'll pass on the baton. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Dean, for hosting us. And Zen Ed Project and DC Education for Social Justice, of course, very important work. Um, Okay, is it Eli? Oh, you heard your name, didn't you, black man? Ain't nothing wrong with that, Ain't nothing wrong with that brother. Y'all seen that movie, The Book of Eli? Yeah. yeah, remember that last scene? Ain't but one King James Bible left, and it's all in his head. But as teachers, I ain't got to tell y'all that. Remember what he said? Write everything down exactly as I said, right? So five minutes. I'm not going to take long, but I thought about that because it's always an honor to be with educators. Sometimes I tell our colleagues here at Howard, we wouldn't last a day in a public school. Tell your hair out by noon, run out crying, because it's real work. I, I was fortunate enough, the years I lived in Philadelphia, to work a number of years with the um, Philadelphia Public Schools, and we put together the curriculum for the African American History course. It's mandatory there in high school. And nothing I love better than to escape the administration building, which I was rogue many days, and, uh, and just hang out with teachers. So this is the best part of today, and one of the highlights probably, in fact, for sure, or this entire year to be together. So we won't be up here long. We won't get into these plenaries. Um, I saw that my mother's from Alabama, Phoenix City, Alabama, close to Phoenix City, Russell County. I saw they celebrated Confederate Memorial uh, Day down there the other day by dragging a black woman and uh, beating her up in a, in a Waffle House, uh, which is entirely consistent with the United States of America, in fact, because we continue to fight the Civil War. Uh, this conversation about Reconstruction, I think Reconstruction is probably the single most important period in American history. It's not the Founding Fathers. For sure, it's Reconstruction, I think. And the Civil War Amendments really are the ones that are most avoided by the courts and society. The betrayal of the 13th Amendment and some other things we'll talk about when we get in these workshops. But there are many Reconstructions, even as there's only one Civil War that's always going on. We're in arguably the third Reconstruction if we hear uh, Dr. Barber, Reverend Barber talk about it, and they'll be here this summer for the Poor People's Campaign. While we're here, they're at the African American Civil War Museum. Uh, our friend Frank Smith and 
the Veterans and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Committee, a lot of people in the Black Power Chronicles are there right now talking about that. They end up in this city as a result of the second reconstruction when they put article, they use article two of those Civil War amendments to put in place legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, and the uh, Fair Housing Act of 68, written almost in the blood of Martin Luther King. But Reconstruction, we were this close. That's how I think about Reconstruction. We were this close. 1868, Thaddeus Stevens dies. The GOP begins turning towards stability and order. Familiar? Away from radical reconstruction. Leave those Negroes alone. I think about David Blight's work where he talks about the folks who are for emancipation and the folks who are for reconciliation. This is, in other words, this isn't a history concept. What we were doing in writing curriculum, one of the things we always struggle with, how do you get students to think about the past? And we, I ain't telling anybody in here, especially folks who, for whom assessment drives instruction. Oh, this is nice talk, but uh, where's the test, right? Well, how do you get young people to invest in inquiry? You have to have them see themselves in history. So, you know, you want to stand the black codes, just go to a Starbucks in downtown Philly. If you want to stand Jim Crow, just go to Alabama or go to my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee, where, thank you, somebody gets, uh, four people get killed and a guy gets bailed and then they blame it on the law. This is Reconstruction. The Civil Rights Act of 1866, we think about that. The Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is as close as this country ever came to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So, I mean, we can think about parallels that even a five-year-old can get if you put her in the right frame of mind. So how, how we talk about Reconstruction dictates how we study it. The plot line, the Africanization of America. I like bringing this brick out. I got about four copies of these and marked them up. You know, this is Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America. You, know, you get to page 711, and he does a survey and says, how is Reconstruction taught in these schools? And he says, well, there are several ways. Then by the end of the chapter, he gets into putting Reconstruction in global context, right? Because he's reading race as class in some ways. And we think about it, that's still how we live in this society. But it's interesting, as I bring this to a close, you got the two-minute sign, so I know I must be around 30 seconds now. I'm going to get to these plot lines. <laughs> There are several ways to narrate Reconstruction. We could talk about the plot line of the Civil War amendments, the plot line of the Emancipationists versus the Reconciliationists, and or representative figures. We got a Cardozo High School. This guy gets run out of South Carolina. After they lock him up for a year, he was the Secretary of State in South Carolina during Reconstruction, and he's in the bloodline of, of course, Eslanda Good Robeson, Paul Robeson's wife. These are DC stories. You got a guy who was the dean of the law school here at Howard, thank you, John Mercer Langston, who was debating with Frederick Douglass on the centennial of the American Revolution, they in 1875 arguing. Douglass is like, yeah, we gotta get this thing together. John Mercer Langston is, we need some black institutions. I'm going a little bit farther than you, Fred. But of course, neither of them are able to realize the promise. We could read it through the presidents. Make a lesson plan like, what, what, what might James Garfield have done? Right? When, you read, when you listen to James Garfield's inauguration address, he's only president for like three months before he gets blown away, right? But in the, in the thing he says, there's no such thing as second class citizenship. American Negroes must be full citizens. I'm like, wow, this is a Civil War veteran, right? Because U.S. Grant, after he stumbles through his first administration, scandal-plagued administration, and gets reelected, he makes the turn toward this conservatism, and the Negro is left out in the cold. That's why Rayford Logan, who taught here for many years at Howard, called that period the nadir after the end of Reconstruction. But Finally, I love those Civil War amendments because I get to teach at Howard Law School. I got a law degree and realized that the law a lot of times just ends up being your honor, please. And so, <laughs> so in teaching the Reconstruction Amendments, what we go through is, and I'll just leave these three things, the evasion of the 13th Amendment, humanity unresolved. That's really the issue. The 14th Amendment and capitalism. Corporations love it more than we do. And finally, the 15th Amendment and the failure of democracy. We're still fighting the Civil War. Every day is a reconstruction. And maybe with this conversation we're about to have now, we'll get to have a real conversation among educators on how we can best attack this. And I hope this ain't the last time, Dean, you bring everybody to the house so we can have a real conversation. Next time, we're going over their spot, though. <laughs> Thank y'all. Um, that Reconstruction was the most important period in American history. It certainly was the most important period in my history. And I want to tell you why. Um, and, and no flash photography, please. Every time a flash goes off, I lose another synapse. And at my age, I can't spare anymore, you know. Um, 
So incidentally, if you want to contact me, um, like you know about a sundown town and I don't, or you have a problem with what I say, or you love what I say, or whatever, that's my email address, okay. Um, so my first full-time teaching job was at Tougaloo College. I hope this audience doesn't need a full-blown introduction to that term. Tougaloo College is a very good college. It's in Mississippi, it's black, it's small. So a lot of people up here in DC have never heard of it. Um, but I, I loved it. I had a great time there for seven years. My first year there, I had what I might call an aha experience, but it's really more accurately called an oh no experience. Because I was teaching a section of what was called the Freshman Social Science Seminar. This was a course invented by the history department that introduced our students to all of the social sciences. You know the drill, so I, was a soci I am a sociologist, anthropology, poli sci, psych, etc. It did this in the context of African American history. Um, and when you're in that context, that's the same chronology as, shall we say, regular American history. Um, so second semester begins right after Christmas, of course, but it also begins right after the Civil War, right? It begins with the period known as, and I usually have my audience say this back to me, but I won't with you people. If you don't know why we're here, it begins with the period called, well, go ahead. Yes, very good. Okay, so I had a new group of students that first afternoon class of the second semester. I didn't want to do all the talking that first day of class because they were new to me. I wanted to hear from them. So I asked them, what is Reconstruction? What happened to them? And 16 of my 17 students, all African American, said to me, Reconstruction was the period right after the Civil War when black people took over the governments of the southern states, but they were too soon out of slavery and so they screwed up and white folks had to take control again. Now that's a good reaction. I can't tell you how many times when I give this talk at colleges and so on, people start taking notes. Oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's at least three direct lies in that sentence, are there not? Right. All right. Black folks never took over the government of the southern states. All of the southern states had white uh, governors throughout the period. All but one had white legislative majority. Second of all, the Reconstruction governments, I know I could generate this from you, but not within the time frame. Uh, Second of all, the Reconstruction governments did not screw up. Without exception, across the South, they passed the best state constitutions that the Southern states have ever had, including better than the ones that they labor under today. Mississippi, in particular, had better government during, during Reconstruction than at any later point in the 19th century. Okay? And the third lie, therefore, is not that white folks took control at the end of Reconstruction, or a certain group of white folks took control. Um, we have to remember the political reversal that happened beginning in 1964, in particular in this country. But in the 19th century and into the 1920s, the Democrats were the party of overt white supremacy, called themselves the white man's party, and they took over using force and fraud, using KKK. In fact, it was, of course, the original Ku Klux Klan. So I thought to myself, what must it do to you to believe that the one time your group was center stage in American history, they screwed up? Can't be good. Now, if it's happening, that's a different matter. We have to come to terms with it, figure this out. Why? But it did not happen. This is an example of what we in sociology call BS history. Okay? <laughs> that, that term, that's bad sociology? <laughs> what were you thinking? Never mind. All right. So I had to do something about this after a while. There's a longer story here, but I can't tell it. Uh, I got a group of students and faculty at Tougaloo and at the nearby white school, Millsaps, and we wrote a new history of Mississippi aimed at the ninth grade class where these lies were most flagrantly being disseminated, including in all black classes by black teachers who were just teaching the, the white supremacist textbook. The state of Mississippi is a textbook adoption state. They rejected our book for school use. We had to sue them. The low, the, Cases called Lowen et al. versus Turnipseed et al. There's both a joke and a story there, but never mind. We did win, uh, and our book got adopted by those school districts that chose to use it. Unfortunately, a minority of districts, but at least it was out there, and, and some did use it. Well, then I moved to Vermont and taught at the University of Vermont. I claim to have taught at the blackest and the whitest schools in America. Uh, but anyway, uh, and one of my early church services at the Unitarian Church, because I had become a Unitarian along the way, uh, the minister in Vermont gave the same 
outline of reconstruction that my students had given me that first day of class in Mississippi, and I realized this is not just a Southern problem. And so I want to teach you that Reconstruction is a national problem. Reconstruction was a national move. Of course, it was the political reconstruction of the southern states. I understand that. Okay? But it, is, it was also an ideological movement, an anti-racist movement. Um, and there's some terrific books that teach it that way, which is exactly how it should be taught. And it is misunderstood nationally. And I have a couple of slides I'm going to show in the last... I'll, we'll talk about this more when, I'm, when I have more time with you. But this is my curve of racism in United States history. It is a terrible curve because it doesn't even have units. All right? It's kind of impressionistic. It's also the very best curve that's ever been done on this subject. <laughs> because it's the only one. All right? And so you can see the nadir of race relations, which I was so pleased to have Professor Carr mention. I give him slightly different dates than uh, the Howard professor who invented the whole concept, but, well, who described it. it. It's a real concept. It's on the, and so you see the nadir in terms of the high race relations, and that's when these lies about reconstruction became, so when you learn about reconstruction determines what you learn about reconstruction, and we are still coming out of this nadir in terms of how we are teaching about reconstruction. And finally, I want to quote my guy, this is W.B. Du Bois, he was a sociologist after all, so I have to quote him, don't I? Um, first, first sentence there, you can read it, can you read it in the back? Okay, there might be somebody visually impaired. I've actually raised guide dogs, so I, I'm aware of this. So I'm going to read it to you. One cannot study Reconstruction without first, frankly, facing the facts of universal lying. That's very true. Second, Reconstruction history was one of the most stupendous efforts the world has ever seen, ever saw, to discredit human beings, an effort involving universities, history, science, social life, and religion. And finally, we have got to the place where we cannot use our experiences during and after the Civil War for the uplift and enlightenment of mankind. So that's still true, and it's up to the people in this room, you and me, to reverse that. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. One more uh, round of applause for our amazing panelists. <laughs>